everyone. It is two o'clock. Let's get our Water Wednesday started. My name is Yiling Zhuang. I'm the Water Resources a Regional Specialized Agent in UF IFAS Extension in Central District. I'm based in the Medford Research and Education Center in Apopka. So welcome to Water Wednesday. And our Water Wednesday series, it's a uh, uh, I call it a water awareness program. So we cover a wide range of topics. So last Water Wednesday, we discussed the application of drones in water resources management. Before that, we had some topics about landscapes, urban agriculture. And today, I have our regular guest speaker, Ms. Tia Savisi, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent uh, in Orange County, come to join us and talk about uh, how to protect your land, uh, your lakefront uh, using natural and healthy shorelines. Uh, so like I said, it is a water awareness program. We cover a wide range of topics uh, and we would like to reach a wide audience. Uh, so we host this webinar on Zoom and also broadcast on YouTube. So in the chat box, you can see already posted the link of our Facebook page. So if you like our topic, uh, you like this talk, or if you want to rewatch it, you can click the link and it will take you to our, you, uh, our Facebook page. And after this webinar, I will also post uh, the video on our YouTube channel, which I will put in the chat box. Without overdue, let's welcome our guest speaker, is Tia Savisi. Yay, thank you and happy to be here on this beautiful summer day talking about natural and healthy shorelines for lakefront protection. So this talk today we're going to cover mostly like uh, plants, beneficial and plants that you might want to take out from your lakefront and it also applies to uh, stormwater ponds. So let's get started. Um, so I am the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent, and in case you're not familiar, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is based on these nine principles that help you have a beautiful and environmentally friendly yard. The principle we're going to talk about today is number nine, which is to protect the waterfront. So the benefits of shoreline plants are many. Um, they help to protect the water quality in general. Um, they do that by slowing runoff like from the land, catching that sediment, the soil, and the attached nutrients. Um, they capture nutrients by actually sucking it up into their plant bodies. And they provide for wildlife habitat like birds, butterflies, hummingbirds, fish, fish nurseries and many more. And they're also beautiful to look at, you know, if they're done right, flowers and grasses, and they really make the lakefront or your water body look healthy. So what makes a nice lakescape or a nice pond? Um, we want it to be full of native plants and we want to manage the nuisance vegetation. And we want to do that because the nuisance vegetation can overtake some of the beneficial natives. So it does need some management to keep it into check. Um, it's okay to have it go completely natural too. Um, we, we also provide access for recreation. So the human centric um, idea here, like we might have a cleared area to get our boat in and out. Um, and we also want it to be aesthetically pleasing if it's your backyard, something that you're looking at all the time. And so I'll be going over some of the plants today and how to take care of them, and in which case you might need a permit. So let me start with the Florida native species. So we recommend planting um, mostly Florida native species, um, maybe all Florida native species along the lakefront, because this is a wild and natural area. There's different zones that you need to be aware of when you're planting, um, you know, going all the way into the water and then the slope 
of the water and then you know the uplands or the bank top and so this is important when you're doing planting because you need to select the right plants for the right zone of the shoreline. So the ones in the water, um, those are called emergent plants, or maybe they're in the deep water. And then we call the bank slope, the riparian zone, that's seasonally wet. And then the, the upland area is usually pretty dry, but occasional flooding. And so then by kind of knowing where the plant goes, you can plant the correct configuration in your lakefront. So um, I'm going to go over all the different plants for these domes, but you can look up the list here by um, scanning our QR code or just Googling like UF list of freshwater aquatic plants for Florida. And they're all in a um, table here on this blog that I wrote. So starting with the uplands, this is the kind of high and dry area although it may be getting seasonally flooded, you know, when we have that 10 inches of rain along with a hurricane. So things like the cypress tree, they actually can be completely submerged in water and they're very drought tolerant. So when we do have the dry season and they're way above the water, they can handle that too. So a great kind of all purpose plant. Um, there's a couple different species of cypress here in Florida. And so um, other plants for the upland include some of these clumping grasses like the cord grass or the mully grass, um, smaller bushes like wax myrtle or button bush. Um, also the beautyberry, the elderberry, those both provide berries that can be eaten by birds and other wildlife. And also some wildflowers can go in that area like some of the goldenrod species or bacopa. Um, there's a lot of trees you can plant besides the cypress, the maple, the elm, um, sweet gum, holly, and the sweet bay magnolia likes the wet areas as well as the Carolina willow. So a lot of selection and there's even more here, but these are the most popular species that are um, commercially available. So here's just a picture of some cord grass and cabbage palms. And I think there's a little cypress tree in there. And this is what a really nicely planted upland area can look like. Um, you know, the cord grass is very low maintenance, maybe just once a year you give it a haircut. Um, they're all, these are all Florida native species. And so they do really well with um, no pests or disease problems, you know, just a little trimming maybe once a year. And since it's a really nice buffer zone, we can call this a riparian buffer zone, it's helping to protect the slope from erosion and filter any nutrients or pollutants that might be coming, you know, from the roads or the lawn or landscape maintenance. So this is really what's keeping our lakes clean. So the next zone um, downwards towards the water, but still usually above the water line, but the soil stays pretty wet is the riparian zone. So in this one, the most common plants are the canna, the yellow canna, also the blue flag iris. And be sure you're choosing the native species of these, the canna flaccida. There's a lot of ornamental cannas. And, and they do well in the wet areas, but um, it's better to go with the native species because they're more adapted to our climate and the wildlife can use them. Um, the iris, also some ground covers here like the frog fruit, the bacopa, lizard's tail that does well in the shade too, if you have a, a shady area. Um, the swamp hibiscus that gets beautiful um, flowers, you know, grows about head high with the big red flowers. There's other types of aquatic hibiscuses like the pink, the marshmallow. And then uh, we have our milkweed, Asclepius perennis, that does good in kind of wet and shady areas. And then some other wildflowers like the Carolina aster, um, the marsh beggar tick cardinal flower and a lot of ferns you know do really good in this area and ferns have a great you know filtration system with their roots to really 
absorb any of those extra nutrients or, you know, filter out the pollutants from the water. And all these plants are commonly available at native plant nurseries. You can look for the Florida Association of Native Nurseries or FAN, F-A-N-N dot org. They have their website. You can find them there to purchase. So here's some pictures of those, the golden canna, the native species has all yellow flowers. And then the climbing aster, this is kind of like a viney or you can shape it like a shrub. It's just loaded with these whitish purplish flowers and it's tons of bees on them when they flower, um, usually flowering in the fall. So on the bottom right is the frog fruit. And this is something we also recommend for like alternative lawns. It is a a butterfly host plant, a larval host plant to a couple, two or three different species of butterfly. So if you do see some little holes in the leaves, um, don't worry about that. It's probably the caterpillar of the butterflies that are eating it. And so that's good. You're providing food for butterflies. So the next zone is kind of in the water. We call this the emergent zone. And the most popular ones here are like the pickerel weed, and the duck potato pictured here. And so as you can see, there is water and they're you know, two to four inches deep in the water. When we do get heavy rains, these can be completely submerged in the water and they will do just fine. Also when it dries up and they are on the land, that's okay as well. They're used to the seasonal fluctuations of their water level. So um, some other plants here are like the soft rush, the giant bull rush, alligator flag, um, the spike rush, that's a low, lower growing rush, and cattails are native. They're um, useful for wildlife and birds, especially like to live in them. Um, some people consider cattail a, a native type of nuisance species. But um, it's good to leave a little bit. You can keep it, you know, like manage it in a clump or something so it doesn't take over your whole um, lakefront. It, it can be aggressive and spread a little bit, but it is a beneficial species. So here's that purple hickory weed. And, and this is one of my favorite one. It flowers almost year round and you can see butterflies and other things on it. So here's the next zone. This is the deep water. So as deep down as the light can go, you can find those water lilies, which is the white water lily here, the Nymphia odorata. Um, also the cow lily, which is also called spatterdock. And that has the yellow flower that never really seems to open up that much. Um, also, we have the beneficial grass, the maiden cane grass, and also the cut grass. So don't mistake that for torpedo grass. That one, when you feel the leaf blades, it will be kind of rough feeling and even like cut, cut your hand a little bit. And then the American lotus, that's also native. And uh, you'll see that in Payne's Prairie when you're driving up, you know, to the Gainesville area. Beautiful flowers. Here's a nicely managed lakefront. You know, we have a little clump of duck potato in the front, and then we have the spatter dock, the cow lily, you know, in the back. So you can see here the different layers. Now the cow lily doesn't really like it on the land, and then the duck potato doesn't really want to live four feet deep its whole life. So you can see how planting the things in the correct um, lakefront zones can be beneficial. And if you're working with a, um, a retention pond or something, you might ha not have all these layers, but you might just, you know, be planting the perimeter of the shoreline. So now let me tell you about some of the nuisance species that you want to watch out for and you might want to hand remove or um, get some chemical treatment on them. So what do we mean by nuisance species? Um, they're mostly non-native. But like I mentioned, the cattail are native, but sometimes people choose to manage them. Um, I recommend not to completely eliminate them, but, you know, they can keep them to a clump or so. Also, grapevine is another native species that, you know, it's a vine, it's climbing, it can be a little bit of a nuisance. So it's okay to take some of that out. Um, they spread quickly. 
and they may be harmful to native plants and wildlife, more talking about like the exotic invasive species, um, because both of the cattails and grapevine are beneficial to wildlife. So here's one of the worst aquatic weeds, torpedo grass or panicum repens. And this is a non-native nuisance plant. It is a spreading grass. You can see the underground stem so that it just spreads and creeps and crawls. And this one can grow so thick that it smothers out native plants. It's also difficult to remove by hand because if you leave a little piece of that root, then it can just grow back. And so this is best treated with the herbicide, like there's an aquatic version of, of Roundup that's aquatic safe. And you can get a spray person to come spray and spray it, you know, it usually takes a couple treatments um, to remove it and then cutting and removing the dead vegetation. Now this torpedo grass, you know, it can like wet lawns too. So if you notice this growing in your lawn or your turf grass, then you might want to reduce your irrigation and try to dry it out a little bit. Um, this can also come up in people's shrubs and bushes. And um, that can be a problem too, like living on the lakefront. So in that case, you might want to cut it back to the ground. And then when it regrows just a little bit at that point, you could spray it with herbicide. So here's a floating plant that's problematic. This is the water hyacinth, Icornia crassipes. And it's a floating plant and it's known to clog up waterways because it just reproduces so quick. Um, so this does just float on surface and you can just pull it out. And some people even um, use this in different countries to help build their compost piles because it is very rich in nutrients and grows fast. Um, it is illegal to transport this, so don't like carry it around in your car or take it somewhere else. Um, but if you do live on the lakefront and you're pulling it up, you could compost it and it won't really grow back. Whereas the, um, the torpedo grass, you don't want to compost that because it will probably grow and be a problem. So the primrose willow is another one. This is a Ludwigia peruviana. And note that there are many native new Ludwigia species. So this peruviana species here, you can tell it has the, one of the largest flowers of all the Ludwigia species we have here in Florida. And it also has large kind of like soft, um, you know, velvety leaves. So it's a tall herbaceous plant. It can get five to 10 feet um, with these big yellow flowers. And this is pretty easy to remove by hand. It doesn't have a vigorous root system. You can uh, chop it with a machete or something and yank it out or chop the root with the machete and get it out pretty easily. So it's something that is um, pretty easy to control by hand and manage it. Um, so it is a non-native nuisance plan, but it's not particularly hard to manage. But just be careful of those similar native species and don't take those out. This is, this is probably the worst weed of all, the hydrilla, hydrilla verticulata. And this just grows so fast and it can clog up entire lake. So another non-native nuisance plant. And this is a submerged plant, which I didn't really mention about earlier, but this grows in the water, under the water. Um, not much of the plant usually comes above the surface of the water. Here it's just so thick that it's coming up a little bit. So this is just hard to get rid of either way um, by using your hand removal techniques, um, pulling it up, raking it up, because just one little piece of this can make a whole new plant. Um, so often if a lake gets infested in this hydrilla, they will um, bring in some fish, some grass carp to, um, they're kind of like vegetarian fish and they eat the hydrilla and other vegetation. And so a couple fish can kind of keep a uh, big hydrilla population under control and they size like how many acres is the lake and put the appropriate number of fish in there. Now they will eat the beneficial native vegetation too. So you have to be careful of that. 
So let's get into talking about actually restoring a shoreline or if you're just getting started. Um, so one thing that you wanna do is check with your state and local governments and find out what permits are required um, to do any type of modification, clearing or treating shoreline um, vegetation. So um, this is a kind of slide for Orange County. This is where I'm at in Orlando, Florida. And you can see the Orange County application for the shoreline vegetation. So depending on your municipality, you may have to fill out you know, this form or a similar form. So make sure you um, check maybe your local municipality because like here in Orange County, we have the city of Orlando, um, the city of Winter Park, and they all have different processes for lakes like Winter Park has their whole own lakes department and you have to go through them. Um, also the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and the Bureau of Aquatic Plant Management. If you're not sure where to start, you can call them first. But definitely triple check all this stuff like make sure you have all the right forms from everybody. If you're in um, Seminole County, here's the rules for them. And as you can see, Seminole has a little different rules. They say um, if it's less than two acres or over 160 acres, you know, that's one of the exceptions of having to get the permit. And then if it's larger than that, they need an FWC permit. This is um, pretty standard about having an access corridor of 50 feet or 50% of the shoreline whichever is less, but different municipalities will have different numbers here. It might be a 30 foot access area. It might be a hundred feet access area. And so um, be sure to read the permitting carefully and then check with your local municipalities, the county, if you're in a city um, or the FWC. So what do you need a permit for? So um, per the Aquatic Weed Control Act, you will need a permit if you're hiring a professional, um, if you're using herbicide, um, if the project proposes excavation, dredging, filling, any type of earthworks or moving soil because that soil can pollute the um, water body or using heavy equipment. In that case, they might um, require you to put one of those yellow turbidity barriers with that floating yellow thing out. And so if you're um, hiring somebody to do it or if you're using any type of chemicals, you should definitely check to see if you need a permit. Um, again, there can be some exemptions, but those are just um, general rules. Now, in situations where a permit may not be needed, um, that's when if you're like creating your access corridor to be cleared by hand, doing any type of hand removal of nuisance vegetation, like if you're pruning or removing the dead stuff like dead leaves or dead flower heads, um, then you don't need a permit for that generally. And you generally don't need a permit if you're going to plant the beneficial native plants. So they like to see that. Again, um, these are just generalizations and check with your local municipality on the specific rules. So here's kind of the steps to get started. Um, you want to prepare the shoreline, you know, how are you going to clear it or adjust it? Is it going to be by hand with mechanical stuff or are you going to spray it with an aquatic certified herbicide? Um, you want to select your native beneficial aquatic plants and make a planting plan, you know, according to what zone they're supposed to go in. And then like any garden, it does need a little bit of maintenance. So if you hire a contract to do that, they might want to set you up on a monthly or a quarterly maintenance schedule, um, because if you're going to invest this time and money to, you know, get it cleared, plant native plants, then you want to make sure the torpedo grass and stuff doesn't come back. Um, optionally, you can get, you know, your community involved. We all want clean water. This is a very important topic. So educating your neighbors about the importance of the lake health and the creating beneficial habitats for wildlife and, you know, reducing those fertilizers and pesticides around our yards that are ultimately going to end up in the lake.
So know your laws, ordinances, and codes, and you know, be proactive. There's a lot to research and study here. I hope this presentation will give you a good start, but um, you know, you need to dive deep depending on where you're located out to find out the rules in your area. And you might have HOA rules too that you have to jump through those too. And then finally, enjoy. You know, the water body is a beautiful place. It's something nice to look at, and you can enjoy. Uh, recreating and enjoy the wildlife and the habitat. So here, once you get to the design phase, is what we're looking at. Um, you're allowed to have, in this situation, a 30-foot access corridor, which almost always goes around wherever your dock is, or you can put it, if you don't have a dock, you can put it anywhere. So say this is a 100-foot shoreline here. So you want to diagram out the different plant species, and then you want to say what is going to be removed and what's going to stay. So in this diagram, they're going to um, remove the maiden cane and the pickerel weed within the access corridor, also the knotgrass. Um, those are beneficial. And they are going to remove all of the torpedo grass, which is good. And then they also have some cypress trees and cattails that they're going to leave alone because they're just okay. They're not in the access area or anything. So here's might be what you um, do for our replanting diagram. So after you, re you remove, you know, the, the bad stuff, then you might have to do some replanting. Um, usually they require 80% of the lakefront outside of the access area be vegetated with beneficial um, native vegetation. So here's just a sample. We talked about the different zones. So the cypress tree, the cord grass, uh, the wax myrtle, the cabbage palm in the uplands. As we approach the waterline, we have the canna and the iris there. And then inside of the water, there's emergent zones, the picker weed, the duck potato, the, the giant bulrush. And then out in the deep water, the littoral zone is the um, water lily and the maiden cane. That's where the spatter dock can go. And I find an aesthetically pleasing way to um, do these planting diagrams is to keep them in, in little clumps. And then you can have like some clear boundaries so you can maintain in between and keep them in nice little clumps, or it can be like a big band of them together. And I think that's the most aesthetically pleasing because then you can see the purple picker weed and then the white duck potato over there. You can mix all the plants together too. Um, that can tend to get a little bit messy. But um, as long as you have the shoreline area covered, then you will be good in meeting your permit requirements. So here's some examples of some planting plans. You know, here in the top right, the, the grass is going down and then we have just rows of cord grass in our little buffer area. And then, you know, the lake is gonna have different depths of, of water. And then um, the cypress trees are actually growing in the water, but you can see that picker weed around the bases out there. On the picture to the upper left, this is a retention pond that's been planted with some cord grass. And, you know, this is some nice little clusters of cord grass here. And then you can see some, um, looks like picker weed in the background. So planting is easy. Um, you know, you just grab a shovel and stick the shovel in the water and then push it forward and put the plant right behind it pull the shovel up and just step on the plant a couple times. So this is something you can do the planting yourself. Um, it's pretty easy to do. You can get a pair of swamp boots or just an old pair of tennis shoes you don't mind wearing in the water and just a normal shovel to make the hole. And um, these plants are pretty easy to propagate too, like the pickerel weed and stuff. You can uh, make little um, root divisions of those so you can once you have a couple you can keep spreading them around your shoreline and these native plants are available at um, native plant nurseries so you can buy them here's some that we did around our retention pond at, here at the extension center and this is what they might look like when you get them in the bare root 
So bare root plants are just fine and they're kind of easier to pop in. On the left here is the pickerel weed. And then we have the iris and on the right hand side is the spike rush. And after you plant them, um, then just step on them a little bit. It's natural for some of the leaves to dry up and um, they will grow back. So don't really worry about that. What you do want to watch out for is like, see the one that fell down or maybe one is like floating out in the water. So if, if they have fallen over or they're floating, then get them back and stick them back in the soil so they can root and survive. So here's some um, native plant nurseries that carry um, aquatic plants like Green Isle Gardens. They're over in Groveland, Florida, South Seminole Farm and Nursery. And uh, we're not endorsing those, but they're just ones that carry some aquatic plants in the Central Florida area here. And then you can look for the different plant nurseries in your county, uh, county by county in the FANN. Um, dot org, Florida Native Nurseries dot org, or PlantRealFlorida.org, and they have a list of nurseries. So just a little bit on maintenance. So you do want to set up a maintenance plan to keep your uh, lakefront or shoreline looking good, and that will manage these nuisance species um, that might float in or pop in. Um, you can see if you look closely by the seawall, there's a little bit of blue dye with their herbicide that marks where they sprayed. Um, and then the beneficial plants will, you know, fill in and maintenance will be reduced over time. And even the, the beneficial plants, see how these are all green? So the lakescaping contractor who does this job um, they come in, you know, once a month and they just pick, pick off the um, brown leaves. So it's okay to remove the brown leaves, even to deadhead the plants, but maybe let them um, release the seeds first and some of the wildlife eats the seeds. But just to keep it looking good, you can do that. So a couple more like just Florida friendly practices in general, you know, selecting no, low maintenance plants, right plant, right place. I'm watering efficiently and following the water restrictions because if you're over irrigating, that's going to push all those nutrients in, in your lawn into the nearby water bodies. And another thing about the fertilizer is we recommend a phosphorus free fertilizer. It's actually mandated in many Florida counties according to your fertilizer ordinance and also using um, slow release nitrogen. Nitrogen is also um, limited in some counties during the summer months because of the heavy rainfall and nitrogen is a mobile nutrient that will end up in our water bodies going with the water. So no fertilizer or pesticides within 25 foot of the water body and that just helps to keep that stuff out of there because it will travel in the ground um, for your upland trees and landscape beds, you know, adding that two to three inch layer of mulch that helps keep the soil there. It helps, you know, build the soil and prevent erosion. Um, use your compost, your yard waste, and use that in your yard. Um, the downspouts that are coming off of your house, instead of diverting them into the lake or down your driveway, it's best to divert them into your turf grass or landscape areas to let those plants be able to take up that water and filter the water before shoving it off of your property. And using the least toxic chemical first and you know more toxic chemicals only as a last resort, you know, if you have something really bad like chinch bugs in your lawn. But if you can, you know, have a nice uh, biodiversity of plants, you can work on creating more of a ecological landscape where the good bugs, you know, compete with the bad bugs, and then you have less pest problems. So here's just a couple photos of some creatures that you might find and enjoy around your lakefront. And um, there's me in there too, and enjoying the water body. And so that about wraps it up here. I'm going to give you a couple resources that you can follow up on. So some helpful University of Florida IFAS publications include the guide to selection and installation of stormwater ponds 
pond plants. Um, also, the Florida Friendly Plants for Stormwater Pond Shorelines here by uh, Gail Hansen. So these are two great documents you can find online. Um, as far as regulatory agencies, you have the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission um, in Orange County. You know, here's our email and phone number for the Environmental Protection Division. Um, you might also have to check with your water management district. So it uh, depends what part of the state you're in, where I'm at here in Orange County. We have some people are in the St. John's Water Management District. Other people are in the South Florida Water Management District, like over by Disney World. But wherever you're at, be sure to know what your water management district is and, and check with them about their regulations. So other um, resources include the Florida Water Atlas, and that tells you, you know, detailed information about uh, many, many water bodies across the whole state. And if you're looking for plants, um, this is a good website here, the plants.ifis.ufl.edu, and that's the Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants. So you can go and look up, you know, the beneficial native ones, the exotic invasive ones, and find their you know detailed profiles with pictures like many good quality pictures so you can identify what you're looking at also if you have problems identifying your plants you can always send me a photo of them by email and you know you can get involved with the lake watch program that's a citizen science program that volunteers go out and test the water quality they collect water samples and you know, check on the depth and the visibility. And there's also a serve program in Seminole County. They do native plantings, they do cleanups. And so you can check out the serve program if you're nearby Seminole County. And there might be more um, statewide that I don't know about, but it's good to get involved and, and be a bigger part of things. So I'd like to thank you, Yiling, for having me today on this Water Wednesday. And um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Here's my email here at the bottom if you want to send me any pictures of your lakefronts. And thank you. Thank you, Tia. That's very informative and a lot of additional resources. So that's great. Uh, I'm posting the links, uh, the additional resources you have on the last few pages on the chat box. And I also noticed we have a couple of questions in the Q&A session. Would you like to start? Uh, I, actually, the first one, it's, uh, I believe it's your class you did earlier about the fruit trees. Uh, just wondering if you have any recordings, if it's on YouTube or somewhere else. Uh -huh. the, the class we did yesterday, the Get Your Grove On class, those will be um, emailed, you, emailed to you, the link to the recording to that. So we just haven't gotten around to that yet, but it should be coming soon. And tune in for the Get Your Grove On class, you know, be every Tuesday now through September 6th. Can they still register now? Mm-hmm. Yep. Good. Yeah, Google UF Get Your Grove On and it's a, a Zoom registration link. All right, that's great. Yeah. Um, and the next question, because I'm not very educated on plants, so forgive me if I'm not saying it right. Spatter dog seems to take over the lake. What's the best way to control it? Yeah, the spatter dock is kind of like, you know, the cattails, like you have a little bit and then it spreads. So there's a couple different ways to control that. If it's not a major problem, um, you can just take uh, something like a machete or your clippers and just clip out some of the leaves because the leaves actually live a long time. But if you just like slice the machete under the water um, and cut the leaf off, then and then rake that stuff out of the lake, then it will um, kind of re reduce their growing. If you want to do a more heavy duty like clearing of them, and this would probably require a permit, you can use the aquatic version of Roundup and spray the tops of the leaves and then it will kill it. 
So it just depends, you know, if you just need to thin it a little bit, you can do some hand removal of the leaves. If you need to kill it, you might resort to herbicide. Um, they do have very long stems to their leaves and their roots are very large in the ground too. So they are quite difficult to try to dig up with a shovel or anything. And you would probably create a lot of, um, you know, muck doing that. Great, thank you. Uh, another question we have here, it's on Facebook. So just wondering, it's when we plant these uh, uh, plants for show, shorelines, any particular time, when should we do it? Or we just see it's dead and we remove it and we plant it? Yeah, about the time of the year, it can really be done at any time of the year. I mean, Florida, we pretty much have a year round growing season. I like to do it more in the fall or the winter or the spring, because usually in the summertime, we get a lot of rain and then the water level is very high. So what you could reach, easily reach with your arm, now your like head is starting to go underwater. But um, so any time of the year, but maybe it would be easier when the water is not super high. Good suggestion. All right, another question just came in about carp, about hydrilla. So will carp fishes eat all the other fishes in the lake or they only eat hydrillas? Uh, carps are more like vegetarian fish. So they just wanna eat the aquatic plant life, but they will eat both the invasive plants like the hydrilla and the native plants. So you have to be careful not to put too many in. And they do um, make the carp uh, like sterile, so they can't breed and overtake the environment. Yeah, I remember one time I went to, uh, I think it was the UF Water Symposium, and there was a research uh, investigating residents' preference on biological control or chemical control, and I think the last is the mechanical control, and the most uh, uh, residents, at least for that lake property, they prefer uh, mechanical control. However, mechanical control, it's uh, very expensive and it's uh, it's a labor intensive and uh, more costly because uh, uh, then they dive into like why they prefer mechanical control, not chemical or biological and turn out to be there was some misunderstanding like a, it's the biological, just like you said, the carp, they cannot reproduce. And uh, yeah, so it's really interesting. I would dig into uh, my own file, see if I can find that research and share with it. others here. Yeah, I remember hearing about that too. And like in this presentation, I mentioned some of the plants that you can easily hand remove some primrose willow or if there's a couple water hyacinths, you know, you can pluck those out of the water. Whereas things like a torpedo grass, you know, you're gonna be, that's a job security right there, like removing that the rest of your life. So in the case with torpedo grass, you know, a little bit of chemical can go a long way and that's kind of more sustainable in the long term to be able to manage the lake and plant the beneficials and have a nice um, lakefront. Whereas the other things that are easily removable by hand, you might as well, you know, just take care of those. Good tip. And, and we have one other question, it's about retention pond, because uh, this retention pond is fed from the major road water runoff. Is that dangerous for birds and wildlife if we try to make it more attractive for wildlife? Or should we use the filtering plants uh, to do the best we can to improve the water quality? Yeah, I would say kind of the, the latter of the answer, like do your best you can to improve the environment. And the aquatic plants are amazing at, you know, helping to filter the water, absorbing those sediments. So if, if nothing else, you know, just to all that runoff and the erosion and the sand and silt in the water, those roots will collect that stuff and ground them and it will help to improve, you know, the water quality. And as far as any kind of pollutants getting in there, that's just, it's gonna be in our environment anyway. So I wouldn't worry about that. 
Is there? Because I know for we use plants uh, to improve water quality, but some plants uh, they die off really quick, and once they die off, it, they release the nutrients uh, back to the water bodies. So, do you happen to have a list of for uh, like that type of uh, plants? Like they're effective in removing new like contaminants from the water body, but we should also keep on top of it because uh, we want to harvest the plants uh, before they release the nutrients or chemicals uh, back to the lake. Yeah, in in nature, you know, you're right, the plant body holds the nutrients. So, you know, if that one dies, but a new one grows up and, you know, takes up those nutrients, that's kind of how it happens in nature. But if there are like a lot of heavy metals or some kind of toxic substance in there, like actually removing that vegetation and hauling it away, you know, to the landfill or something. Would, that's how they do like soil remediation on a commercial level. Yeah, require always require some maintenance. Uh, just want to, oh, just keep. I don't want to say it's a bad news, but just keep a uh, <laughs> keep in mind because uh, I know this question I I got asked a lot. Uh, um, because it's a, uh, I I just think oftentimes we like low maintenance. So we want to plant it and we leave it there, like just leave it be. And uh, better to be zero maintenance. Mm -hmm. But just keep in mind, there's always some maintenance required. Just like Tia mentioned earlier, might need some like harvesting, just remove the plants. Yeah, um, and especially if you're going to like, if you're going to use a chemical spray and like spray all the torpedo grass so it dies. The best thing is just to cut it with the underwater weed whacker and then pull all that vegetation out like with a pitchfork and put it on the shore and let it dry and then, you know, haul it away. All right. All right. We'll take our last question here. Can we, can we having a nice buffer with aquatic plants decreased aquatic midges? Um, I'm not a midge expert, so I'm not really sure, but I did hear that beneficial um, plants do help reduce the midge population. I'm not an expert on that topic either. So we'll try to do some research yeah. and once we'll post on our Facebook under our video. Yeah, I think there is a UF IFAS article about midges and it said like the more beneficial, you know, plants, the healthier the lake is, they won't mm -hmm. be such a big problem. All right, great. So I would like to conclude our webinar by Heather's comment. Fantastic presentation and helpful information. Thank you so much. All right, thank you for having me. Have a great day, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.